Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, esteemed professors, doctors, guests, colleagues, and participants from all over the world. Welcome to Pediatricians Tackle Childhood Obesity and the COVID-19 Pandemic, an international webinar conducted by the International Pediatric Association. Uniting thousands of registrants from all over the world, the Pediatricians Tackle Childhood Obesity and the COVID-19 Pandemic International Webinar provides a holistic view on the issue of childhood obesity as it correlates to the COVID-19 pandemic, from its epidemiology and pathophysiological impact to drive further discussions that have highlight solutions for prevention and intervention. Before beginning today's webinar, we would like to inform you of the rundown of this webinar. We will begin with a welcoming address from the President of the International Pediatric Association, followed by our honorable keynote speaker. Then we will have the presentations from our distinguished panel of experts moderated by our esteemed moderators. There will be a question and answer session for our speakers. Finally, there will also be a panel discussion with our panelists where our panelists will share their comments in an interactive session. To officially open the Pediatricians Tackle Childhood Obesity in the COVID-19 Pandemic webinar, we will now respectfully invite our first speaker to deliver the opening remarks. Professor Enver Hasanoglu, MD, FAAP, is the President of the International Pediatric Association, Secretary General of the Turkish National Pediatric Society, and Secretary General of the Union of Middle Eastern and Mediterranean Pediatric Societies. He has also held directorship position in Gazi University, Ankara, Turkey, between the years 1992 to 2000, where he was also the Dean of Medical School for nine years and a member of Turkish Higher Education Council for four years. For the past 20 20 years, Professor Hassan Oglu has been involved in many programs in Turkey and in the Middle East region, especially on immigrant child health matters. He has been awarded many honorary fellowship titles by various societies across the world for his tireless work and contributions to child health. Without further ado, to the professor who needs no introduction, to Professor Hassan Oglu, the time and screen is yours. Thank you, Anita. Dear colleagues and friends, I'm Professor Hassan Olu, President of the International Pediatric Association. I would like to welcome all of you to this important webinar. First of all, I would like to express my deepest sorrows and sadness on the conditions and conflicts in Ukraine. As I pay committed health and well-being and safety for every child, every age, everywhere. I hope this conflict and war will stop as soon as possible. Dear colleagues, obesity is important health problem and the problems of uh, obesity is rapidly increasing. According to WHO, more than 2 billion adults are overweight and 700 billion of them are obese. The obesity trend in children shows similarity to adults. In 2020, it estimated that 39 million of children under five years old are overweight and obese across the globe. More than 340 million of children and adolescents are overweight and obese. You know, Obesity has consequences like depression, and anxiety, liver diseases, muscular disorders, cardiovascular risk, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes as well. The COVID-19 pandemic has created negative effects and led to weight gain especially in school age children. Due to closure of schools, it affected our children's 
mentally and physically. Even before the pandemic, nearly all countries in the world had already failed to meet the WHO childhood obesity targets. And obese children were expected to increase to 254 million by 2030. As COVID-19 pandemic has not been under control now, this will cause to a significant increase in childhood obesity at future time. As you know, 4th of March is World Obesity Day. And it is important for IPA to brought this problem to you and we will discuss about the problems and I hope this webinar will enlighten to many questions in this object. And once again, I want to thank all speakers, all moderators, and all attendees. Thank you and best wishes. Thank you, Professor Hassan Oglu, for your opening remarks. We will now proceed to the next agenda of the webinar. The next agenda of our webinar will be moderated by two very special and distinguished moderators. It is my great honor today to introduce our moderators for this session. Dr. Michelle Farmer is a pediatrician with a public health background and a subspecialty training in adolescent medicine. Currently, Dr. Farmer is the Chief Medical Officer for Advancing Synergy, an organization that seeks to improve access to technology and research for the prevention and control of NCDs. Dr. Farmer is co-chair of the International Pediatric Association Strategic Advisory Group on NCDs. She is also an active member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, and the International Association for Adolescent Health. She has considerable experience in global child and adolescent health programming with a focus on the integration of NCD screening and prevention into primary care and community-based settings. Dr. Farmer also serves as a member of the WHO Civil Society Working Group on NCDs, where she co-chairs the WHO work stream on meaningful engagement of people living with NCDs. It is a great honor to have you here today. Good morning, Dr. Farmer. Good morning, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for this kind introduction. And I'm very honored to be a co-moderator alongside my colleague, Dr. Aman Pulungan, for this important webinar on childhood obesity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farmer. Before proceeding, we will now introduce um, the second moderator of the session. Professor Aman Pulungan. Professor Aman Bhakti Pulungan, MD, PhD, FAAP, FRCPI on, is the Executive Director of the International Pediatric Association, President of the Asia Pacific Pediatric Association, NCD Child Governing Council, and past President of the Indonesian Pediatric Society and the Asia Pacific Pediatric Endocrine Society. He is also a Professor in Pediatrics at the Department of Child Health Faculty of Medicine of University of Indonesia, Cipta Mangunkusumo Hospital. For the past Past 20 years, he has also been involved in many programs for diabetes and child health in Indonesia and across the globe. He has been awarded as well by the Indonesian Ministry of Health as one of the most eminent person who has been actively involved in a national immunization program as an honorary fellowship by, uh, by the Turkish National Pediatric Association for dedication and contribution to child health and as an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. Recently, Professor Aman has also received the Republica.co.id inspirational figure award 2021 for his work in children's health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Good evening, Professor. Good evening, Adina. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. To, to Professor Aman Fulungan, the time and screen is yours to moderate the next session. Thank okay. you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you, Anita. Okay. Uh, I would like to introduce our uh, keynote uh, presentation. I think we are lucky uh, to have Professor Buta uh, to give the keynote presentation. Can we have the uh, CV, please? Okay. Uh, Professor Buta is a good friend of mine and also one of the, my mentors in uh, International Pediatric Association. 
Dr. Buta is the founding director of the Center Excellent in Women and Childhood and the Institute of Global Health Development at the Agaten University, as well as the inaugural Robert Harding Chair in Global Child Health, Ibn Scholar in Global Child Health, and co-director of the SickKid Center for uh, Global Child Health. Dr. Buta leads large group research group in Toronto, Karachi, Nairobi, focusing on scaling up evidence-based intervention in community setting and implementation of the reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, adolescent health, and nutrition. Intervention in humanitarian context. In 2020, Dr. Buta was awarded the honor of fellow of the Royal Society. And in 2021, he was awarded the Institute for Health Metric and Evaluation Rose Prize for significant contribution to women and child health. I think so many, you know, so long, if I have to read all the CV of the uh, Dr. Buta. And I think I would like to welcome Dr. Buta. Please, Sylvie. Thank you very much for this uh, extremely generous uh, introduction, uh, Aman. And uh, I am um, delighted to be part of this uh, seminar. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, is to share with you uh, uh, my presentation. I want to be sure that you can see the screen. Not yet. Okay, well, let me see if I can share it once again. Uh, here, let's go. So I've been asked yes. to talk about <laughs> tackling uh, childhood obesity during the COVID pandemic. And I'll do it from the lens of a practicing pediatrician and also somebody who has worked very closely with the NCD child uh, group. And I'm very grateful that Dr. Michelle Farmer is in the, in the organizing committee who was the past chair of the NCD child. I happen to be the executive director. What I would like to do over the next 15 minutes is talk a little bit about the global burden of overweight and obesity, the evidence that we were already in trouble before the pandemic, some of the risk factors and determinants that can help you understand why the pandemic might have worsened it. I'll present a little bit of the evidence that this has impacted overweight and obesity burden in children and how. And then I won't have time to go into interventions, but I'll probably just touch upon what is it that we can do as pediatricians. So what about the burden pre-pandemic? It was already very evident that the world basically was facing for children the triple burden of malnutrition. Not only were a large number of children stunted and wasted, but over 38 million children, as our, our worthy president of the IPA said, are either overweight or obese. And many of them have overlapping micronutrient deficiencies. And this is growing at a much faster rate in low and middle income countries compared to high income countries. Uh, this is a joint monitoring uh, group's uh, depiction of what has happened with under five children. So with very young children, we don't get the same sense of large burdens of, uh, of overweight and obesity, but you can already see that in many regions of the world, uh, this is not an insignificant issue. And if you see the trends in prevalence of overweight in children under five, despite a lot of efforts, there has not been a, much, a, a global change. And thankfully now in the Oceania region, we are beginning to see a bit of a drop, but the matter remains unchanged. However, when you get to school age children and adolescents, this becomes a very big problem. And it has been recognized that of the 638 million school age children, about 131 million are overweight. And of the, the 1 billion adolescents globally, 207 million, about a fifth of those are overweight. This can be seen by the temporal trends over time for obesity in girls. And as you can see from the early and 90s to the late 2000s, this has rapidly changed in many regions of the world, high income settings, but also, as you can see, in parts of Africa and parts of Asia. This exponential growth in the number of girls and boys that we published in Lancet a few years ago is something that has begun to con uh, concern people and pediatrician public health providers in all regions of the world. And you will particularly see in the region 
uh, of South Southeast Asia, this has become quite an issue. And even in Africa, this is beginning to emerge as a public health problem. This nutrition transition is not only evident in terms of what happens between young age, school age children and adolescents, but there are also subnational differentials in terms of what is happening. And I'm going to show you some examples from my own country of origin, Pakistan. If you look at Pakistan, very clearly overweight and obesity are uncommon in children under five. But once you get to school age and adolescence, you can see how much it changes, and particularly for girls. Uh, and when you look at obesity in girls, this is also a, a problem that's distributed not necessarily only in high income or well-developed districts, but in, even in rural parts of the country. And this is very well established in women of reproductive age by adulthood. This is the map of obesity in Pakistan, which shows you in women of reproductive age, how it clusters in the north of the country. So the big picture of childhood obesity and overweight is that not only it affects a large proportion of people per se, but it has long-term consequences. And you've heard about some of them, type two diabetes, hypertension, uh, asthma, depression, and particularly type, type two diabetes is increasing in children given high rates of obesity. So then comes along COVID-19 trends. And COVID-19 is, is the one global pandemic that has turned the world upside down. And it's, it's you know, astonishing that as we speak, uh, just from the point of view of proven diagnosed WHO figures, we've had over 438 million cases worldwide, and it's killed about 6 million people. If you take the most conservative estimates of, let's say, only 0.4% of all reported deaths being in children, we are still talking about 13,000 children who have died of COVID in this time period, many with comorbidities. And most of the deaths have occurred either in very young children or in children who have had uh, NCDs. And it's the other secondary effects of COVID on children that I will be talking about largely. But let's get this off the way. What is the relationship between overweight obesity and COVID-19? It's a bidirectional relationship. And as many people know, at least in adults and adolescents, being overweight and obese is a risk factor for adverse outcomes from COVID-19. And there are many reasons for this. This could be because of the, the high ACE2 receptors concentration in adipose tissue, decreased immune status, impaired ventilation, greater risk of respiratory complications. These have all been well recognized as major risk factors for adverse outcomes. But what we are interested in is the indirect effects. And most of the work in the earlier part of the pandemic was around food shortages and undernutrition. This is one of our own publications, which looked at the direction of effect. And the reason I'm showing you as to why it could be a risk factor for increasing undernutrition in, in COVID is through poor dietary intake and, and also exposure to higher rates of fetal malnutrition. But dietary intake not just results in quantitative deficits, it also results in qualitative deficits. And already the world recognized well before the pandemic also that the burden of poor diets is substantial in low and middle income countries. So this is the estimation of premature deaths attributable to dietary risk factors for various reasons. And you'll see poor fruit, vegetable consumption, and diets which are high in processed foods and sugary drinks are issues that are growing in all regions of the world as contributor to burden of disease. This change in diets in COVID-19 has been quite notable. In the early stages with limited food uh, uh, transportation and availability during particularly the early stages of the mitigation strategies, there was absolutely lack of access to fresh produce and whole grains, and which caused many families, particularly poor families, to rely on, uh, on calorie-dense foods, which you know, can maybe uh, cause uh, satiation, but they don't have the nutritional content. And older children and, and adolescents particularly are more predisposed to taking snacks, eating out of control, and also being exposed to a, an unhealthy food environment. And this has been also coupled with tremendous marketing exposure uh, during the COVID pandemic by the industry. And this is called actually COVID washing, uh, using the opportunity of the pandemic to promote unhealthy products during a time of stress. So you can imagine that children who've been exposed to mental stress, been sitting at home, out of schools, and they are then exposed to this marketing onslaught of taking so-called comfort foods. And that's been one major risk factor that people have 
pointed out as being potentially responsible for some of the inadequate or improper poor quality diets during the course of the pandemic. The second big gorilla in the room, of course, is inactivity. And already before pandemic, uh, this was recognized as being a big problem in adolescence. And this is uh, the proportion of children who have insufficient physical activity. You're not talking about 50, 60%. These are in the 80% for various regions. Even in places like Asia, 81% of adolescents were thought to have inadequate physical activity. And then, you know, with school closures and also restrictions, this has been a big issue in the last two years with canceled physical activity classes, virtually no sports, community sports, and obviously children don't have access to the same kind of, of uh, physical activity opportunities as adults might have with, with uh, workout stations, and that also is not available to the poor. This is just a reflection of what happened with activity reflected by just visits or Google Maps on physical activity patterns. And across the board in various countries that I've just illustrated here, you can see the huge dip that took place in the early state of the pandemic, but didn't quite recover until very recently. So this, and in some countries has really not recovered to pre-pandemic levels. I mean, look at Indonesia, look at United States. These are Google movement patterns. So this has been a big issue. So just to conclude this part, what is the evidence from all of this theory that this may have actually happened in children? And now, unfortunately, we don't have good data on that because nobody's been doing surveys uh, in low and middle income countries where you're dependent upon household service. But we fortunately have data from serial longitudinal studies. And this is one such example uh, from the United States from a series of well child visits that have had electronic records that were produced. And as you can see in this particular compilation uh, from, from this health, uh, health system delivery group, uh, these three lines show you the patterns of well child visits uh, with some periodic peaking, uh, 2017, 18, 19. And then look at in purple what happened in 2020. It went down substantially, but then it went up. So we are able to compare pre and post for some of these electronic health records as to what might have happened. And here is what we see. And as you can see for age groups, particularly six to 13, and to some extent, 14 to 17, if you compare by temporal patterns on what was emerging from these well child clinics, this is what has happened in terms of change in BMI. Pretty significant increase amongst young children. And you can plot this in this forest plot. The red bands are those that represent the post pandemic or early state of the pandemic change, and these are pre-pandemic values, is chalk and cheese. So there's been a substantial increase in BMI in the stable well-child checkup system of children by age. And more importantly for me as a public health pediatrician is the impact that we have on young children and adolescents. So what can be done? Let me finish by just indicating that this is not doom and gloom only. We as pediatricians with the increasing awareness can do something about this. So immediately, for example, implementation of strategies to prevent obesity, education, promotion, advocacy, and particularly the triple burden of malnutrition in communities and countries where you have both undernutrition and overnutrition and obesity together. Ensuring that as we recover from the pandemic, that we have uninterrupted access in schools to healthy foods, a promotion of the right kind of dietary interventions and, and uh, fruits, vegetables in schools, rather than unhealthy snacks, and particularly addressing the social safety nets, where the poor may actually be consuming much more unhealthy foods because they are the ones that typically are available in those populations. Remember that we don't have a clustering of obesity only in the rich. It is actually the poor have greater uh, risks of overweight and obesity because of poor diets. And then there is a gender dimension to it, Absolutely, we need to make sure that girls have the opportunity for physical activity as we recover from the pandemic and also access to healthy foods. And the earlier we do it, the better. So I have only this graphic to show you that very clearly shows that the timely intervention at an early stage in childhood gives you much better returns in terms of prevention of overweight and risks of non-communicable chronic diseases than if you intervened either late in adolescence or during adult life. And there is a gradient. You have this window of opportunity all the way to adolescents, and particularly young adolescents, that one needs to keep in mind. 
And to close, we need to be aware as to how we should not do this in the future. So I think all pediatricians are very well aware of the risks associated with school closures. We may have done something in the short term to prevent the pandemic from spreading out of control, but in reality, all the evidence suggests that it had minimal effect. On the other hand, we have created a lot of issues and problems with school closures. So in future pandemics, protection of children and their rights and ensuring that they have access to appropriate education, good social protection, foods, and informing societies and communities to build back better. And, and to do this fairly, reaching the poorest of the poor should be at the forefront of every association's initiatives. And lastly, we have to speak and elevate the voice of the young people. So I hope that many of the adolescents that we work with, young individuals, will be able to speak for themselves and advocate for their own rights and their own health interventions in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bhutta. Um, that was a, a wonderful talk and a great keynote presentation for us to begin our webinar. Um, and um, I think your last slide really reminded us of so many important roles that pediatricians, like those who are on this webinar, uh, can play, that uh, everyone has an important role, but certainly pediatricians as the first point of contact among um, children who are overweight or obese is such an important uh, factor. I also appreciate your comments about elevating the voices of young people, um, as we have done so much of that kind of work with NCD Child, and we are grateful to you for your support as executive director. We're now moving into our session uh, of our special uh, speakers, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. George Msingi as our first uh, speaker among our trio of speakers. Um, and to follow on that uh, comment about elevating young voices, uh, Dr. Msingi has been uh, a very strong uh, young advocate. Uh, he is a Tanzanian physician, and a vibrant NCD's youth advocate. He volunteers with multiple screening and health educational programs in his community. He holds leadership roles as the secretariat of the African NCD's network and sits as a governing council member with NCD Child. He is also uh, a member of the WHO's civil society working group on NCDs and is a co-leader of their advocacy and communication steering group. And he is a wonderful uh, leader within uh, this, this group, uh, and I can attest to that. Uh, Dr. Msingi is passionate about NCDs and is an active advocate against childhood obesity in Tanzania. And now the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Msingi. Thank you so much. Could you unmute me? Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope I'm clear and audible right now. Michelle, please confirm that. <laughs> Uh, yes. I've been told to put my mic next to my mouth, and that, that helps. So thank you yes. so much, and sorry for all the inconveniences. And I'll just go towards my presentation because of time. Uh, so my name is uh, Dr. George Msengi, as Michelle has just introduced me. And I would like to present on the African perspective in terms of how we combat and having a fight against obesity. But to go into that, I would just like to give a regional in terms of clarification of Tanzania. Tanzania is a country that is based in the African region in the eastern side of, of Africa, but also it is a country that is quite uh, blessed in terms of resources, but also in terms of food. It's one of the major producers in the region, and uh, more than 75% of the land is quite Arab. And that we would be expecting a large in terms of terms in terms of how our nutri nutritional status would be. But going towards my presentation right here, I think we all see the image. Uh, that has been actually portrayed in a, in a regional report on the double burden of malnutrition in Africa by the WHO African uh, Regional Office. So in this report, uh, we see a picture of, of two. I would, I would try to, to put them as young girls. And one of the biggest concerns uh, in our region is that there is quite a thin line of margin that differentiates of what we would call as healthy towards what we would call as overweight or obese, but also what we would call as underweight. 
And so taking a, a glimpse into our regional numbers, uh, the prevalence of, of obesity actually in the region is quite high and the original average is 20%. Uh, that is for women, uh, adults, but also around 9.2% for male adults. Now going into Tanzania, which is a country that I'm based in, the numbers are not quite different from that, but we wanted to do uh, a bit of a dig in into understanding how about childhood obesity. Now for the years it has been known uh, or it has been uh, stereotyped that obesity and other non-communicable diseases are, are diseases of first world countries, of developed countries, but this is not quite very uh, true when it comes to what is happening in our setting. Uh, the curve is quite large uh, and the prevalence of all these uh, risk factors together with diseases of non-communicables are quite on large. And so moving towards the slide that we have right now, we, we, did, a, we did actually study and that was an interventional study towards understanding childhood obesity, but also towards understanding when we intervene, would these uh, interventions actually work or not work? And so in 2017, we are under the uh, a Pediatric Association of Tanzania. We did a, a study that actually assessed uh, not only the behavioral part of children in secondary schools in, in Tanzania, but we also did a, an assessment of whether we intervened the pre and post results of the study would either prove to be change or not change. So some of the results of this study can be seen right there. And uh, the prevalence of actually childhood obesity that we found was 2.1 2 and overweight was 9.8. And the slides were quite limited, but uh, we had a higher account for girls. And this is quite even evident in the adults. When you come to the adult prevalence of, of obesity in Tanzania, women, uh, about 15.2% and men go to around 5%. And this, these numbers go back to the, to the pattern that we were seeing in our numbers in children. And so when we did an intervention, we did uh, education and we tried to, to bring about uh, education towards awareness of what is obesity and what actually are the problems that are associated with this. And we found a lot of stereotypes in terms of from what the parents understood as a healthy child. So the child that came up as plumpy or that came out as uh, more fleshy are the ones which were taken to have been uh, more healthier compared to those who are actually within the margin that will be considered as uh, not overweight. And so with this, we, we did uh, educating uh, the parents, but also the children in terms of telling them, so eating sugar sweetened beverages, this is one of the problems that can lead to obesity. We talked to them about physical activity. And so some of the results that we had found in the pre and post survey can be seen in the next slide. Uh, please move to the next slide. Please, could you, yes. So I think the numbers and probably are not very clear because of the, uh, the slide is not very, it's not very large, not very uh, zoomed. But what we found uh, in our numbers is that a large majority of students beforehand spent a lot of their time playing video games and studying. And very few opted for outdoor sports, for example, when it came to, to the pre-assessment and pre prior to the education part. But when we, we tried to, to educate them about what is obesity, what are the long-term complications, uh, what are the current problems that a child can face, and what are some of the behavioral change patterns, but also physical patterns that you can do in terms of uh, what, what can actually lead to, to better weight in the future. So a large majority of the students, uh, more than 50% opted for outdoor sports in alternative to watching TV and playing video games. Now, another slide that is not here probably that was all this data actually has been published in the East African uh, Health Journal. And for those who would want, I'll have the information accessible. But another part of this was towards what the children opted to eat. A large majority, also basing on the, also basing on the financial uh, situation of the children and their parents, uh, would, had opted for sugar-sweetened beverages, which were cheaper compared to fresh juice, for example, or compared to just drinking plain water and other healthy foods. But uh, when we try to understand some of uh, the key points that were challenges and opportunities towards our study, so moving towards the next slide, and we found just in a summary of a nutshell, the following key points. Uh, the first challenge was the socioeconomic status. A large, a large number of the parents and together with the children uh, had opted for unhealthier eating uh, food habits, mostly because the foods were cheaper. 
Now, one of the opportunities that comes hand in hand is this, is that food is actually cheap in our region in, and in Tanzania. The average cost, for example, for a banana in Tanzania is much, much lower compared to other countries outside the region. And so this was also an opportunity that we tried to share with them. But also another key challenge that was uh, very, very common among uh, the parents together with the children is that they had been making uninformed decisions. The parents kept on feeding the same types of food, which actually were, were unhealthy to the children, but also the cultural norms. A lot of our cultural norms come with specifics. We have more 120 tribes in Tanzania, and these tribes come uh, with, with their cultural disparities. And these actually come hand in hand with what they eat. Some tribes would eat the same common foods over and over again. And so some of the findings were that a specific tribe would have children which were overweight compared to other tribes which had uh, probably less fatty and less uh, sugary foods. And this is also an opportunity in which some tribes could learn from the other tribes which eat healthier compared to them. Another thing was limited physical activity spaces. Now in the schools that we tried to intervene, the, uh, some, some had no physical activity spaces that were uh, specifically uh, kept aside, but also some had no sessions for physical activity. And so one of the interventions that we tried to do is we tried to uh, access uh, policies that actually uh, kept emphasis on having physical exercise as part of the routines. And once we had this, we had uh, the programs running in the schools. But another thing was the, uh, a challenge of behavioral change in patterns, especially among the parents. So the parents are the ones which were the main limiting factors in terms of uh, having the children change what they eat or what they believe. Some parents were very stern in terms of uh, we cannot change the food pattern because this is what uh, the breadwinner, the father wants the children to eat or because this is what we have been eating for years. So the opportunities that some parents were, were a great means towards the change. They were quite flexible in terms of trying to adjust towards what was healthier, limiting actually even the quantity of foods, but also limiting the quality of food that the children are eating. Now, one of the biggest challenges that even led us to our, uh, our interventional study was scarcity of data. Now, when you go when you do original analysis of information that exists with regards to child obesity, there's quite little limited information that exists. But with this limited information, there's still a chance to intervene. And so there's a lot of opportunities in terms of research and interventional studies. And just to wind up on this, uh, uh, the, the study that we did, uh, please can you move to the final uh, final presentation, which is just thinking and the study that we did can be found at the East African Health Journal and probably for anyone who'd want further information, uh, they can clearly reach out. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Msingi. Um, I think that this was very important to focus on some of the issues that you bring up. As pediatricians, we often work with families, not just with uh, children, and so these family-centered approaches and looking at cultural norms may be some important uh, interventions and maybe some of the challenges that we should face. Okay, please share. Okay, so our next speaker, can I have the slide of the CV from Dr. Mazur? Okay, I'd like to introduce Professor Arthur Mazur, MD, PhD. Dr. Mazur uh, is a scientific medical science and current position is the vice rector of the College of Medical Science at the University of Rezo. I hope I pronounce it right, Arthur. President of the European Childhood Obesity Group, head of the second department of pediatric endocrinology and diabetology. And in 2010, Prof. Mazur completed his specialization in endocrinology and he was promoted to professor in of medical science in 2017. His area of interest are pediatric endocrinology and diabetology, rare and very rare diseases in children, and the hot carpaci profit, and also the role of nutrition in public health. And also, right now, we would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Mazur, uh, because he's quite active right now because uh, dealing with the children uh, from uh, Ukrainian, the refugee, and he's also professional association membership, including president of European Child Obesity, member of European Academy of Pediatrics, 
Vice President of the Police Pediatric Society, member of the Human Development Committee of the Police Academy of Science, from Mazur has numerous verified publication. Wow, 266 article abstract in national and international scientific journal in total impact factor about, you know, you can read it, you know, well, 405.664. Uh, okay, Arthur, please, your time is yours. Over Thank to you, you very much. Arthur. Thank you very much for kind invitation. May I? Uh, okay. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I would like to uh, start with our mm, webinar about the information that childhood obesity is the one of the greatest problem in the public health. Of course, obesity is the, in this age group is increased the prevalent prediction of prevalence of obesity globally in the 519 uh, back to pre previous, uh, it, it is possible. May I uh, ask back to the for the, to the previous uh, slide. Oh, thank you. Uh, the prevalence, the prediction of prevalence of obesity globally in five to 19 years old children, which was performed by World Obesity Federation or BED, they estimate potential increase in of childhood obesity from uh, 158 million in uh, 2020 uh, to almost uh, more than 250 in 2030. This increase is going to be observed, especially in the middle and the low income countries. In Europe, the greatest and the fastest increase trend of developing childhood obesity were observed in the Central and Eastern Europe countries. The current COVID pandemic has joined to the existing childhood obesity epidemic. The recommendation in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic may unfortunately increase the risk of childhood obesity. On the other hand, obesity in children increase the risk of COVID-19 infection, increase the risk of severe COVID-19 inf infection and its complication. So the COVID-19 pandemic potentially makes obesity prevention more challenging, affects access to availability of the treatment of obesity, and especially affects in the, for example, low and middle income countries. May I ask next slide? The social recommendation uh, during COVID-19 have had an impact for the increased risk of uh, the developing childhood obesity. School childcare closure from estimate 1.5 billion children leaked to the side effects on food security, on dietary quality for children, increased parental stress about the family future and the financial status, which sometimes lead to observed increased violence toward children. And uh, children spend much more sedentary time, screen time, and had less opportunity for play and activity. All of those factors are risk factors of weight gain and uh, obesity progression and obesity complication. Next slide, please. Studies on obesity and related metabolic disorders showed the, an increase in local and plasma mediators, including leptin, insulin, glucose, lipid, and especially various pro-inflammatory cytokines or leukocytes, underlying significant metabolic stress and inflammation associated with excessive deposition, increase in adipose, adipose tissue, and development of metabolic disorders. Frequent aging and death of adipocytes uh, and associated epithelial and mesenchymal cells that enhance the pro-inflammatory signaling, they regulate the uh, IFN-mediated antiviral response and induce tissue expression of molecules that uh, facilitate susceptibility for SARS-CoV-2. We can observe also decrease of shifted antiviral immunity in both the inante and adaptive arms, airway obstruction resulting in hypoxic immunodeficiency and imbalance prone and autoimmune and thrombotic response. The low grade systematic inflammation and arterial dysfunction and procoagulant state in obesity amplify and contribute to COVID immunopathology such as cytokine storm, immunothrombotic tissue injury, 
increased risk of for thromboembolic events, including myocardial infarction, pulmonary thromboembolites, and others. Next slide, please. So we can observe some kind of vicious cycles. Social distance recommendation during COVID pandemic may increase the risk of childhood obesity, but childhood obesity increased the risk of severe COVID-19 infection and complication. Next slide, please. In the letter to, and also during the previous presentation, we can find a lot of confirmation that during COVID-19 pandemic, increased the prevalence of childhood obesity. This is example from Austria. And the, uh, may I back for the previous slide? May I ask for the back to, for the, thank you. Uh, mean BMI standard deviation scores increased by 0 0.2. And from between September uh, 2019 and March 2021, uh, the proportion of children with overweight or obesity increased from 20.7 to 26.2 during this period, uh, according to national Austrian uh, reference. May I ask next slide? Fresh data from Spain showed that childhood obesity can increase risk of COVID-19 infection in children. The accumulated incidence of SARS-CoV-19 uh, infection during about 2,000 group children's uh, study from 4 to 12 years age was 8.6%, but uh, the estimated uh, risk ratio of SARS-CoV infection was uh, 2.5 at 2.5 uh, for children uh, to nine, 4 to 9 years old with stable obesity and abdominal obesity respectively compared with those with normal weight. So obesity increase also risk for the uh, normally uh, SARS-CoV infection. Next slide, please. In the large multicenter cohort, a high proportion of hospitalized children from COVID-19 had obesity as comorbidity. Future more obesity had a significant independent associated with critical illness. Uh, data from about 800 patients from the United States from 45 centers uh, included uh, in, the, in, the, in those group uh, almost uh, 250 uh, children with obesity uh, and 500 uh, with, without obesity. Obesity had a significant independent association with critical illness. The adjusted odds ratio for critical illness with obesity was 3.1. And patients with obesity had the longer adjusted length of stay uh, compared with patients with, without obesity, but did not have increased mortality risk due to the COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the systematic review and meta-analysis of published literature, estimate the effects of pediatric comorbidities on COVID-19 severity. 42 studies containing uh, almost uh, 280,000 children without comorbidities and uh, 9,000 children with comorbidities were included. And severe COVID-19 was presented in 5.1 of children with comorbidities and only 0 0.2 without comorbidities. Random effects uh, analysis revelated a higher risk of severe COVID-19 among children with comorbidities than for the healthy children at risk uh, 1.8. Children uh, with underlying condition also had a, a higher risk of COVID-19 associated mortality. But uh, the main interesting is that children with obesity had a relative risk ratio of 2.87 and uh, increase the risk of the severity, uh, uh, severity um, the COVID-19 infection and complication. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Mazur. Um, this was a wonderful presentation with so much valuable information that highlights the pathophysiology 
and highlights the important uh, role of obesity in severe complications due to COVID. So I know that we'll have a lot of uh, opportunity after um, our, uh, our final speakers to explore that a little bit more uh, with you. And I wanna thank you for that very insightful presentation. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Margarita Barrientos Perez. Uh, she's a pediatric endocrinologist uh, with master's in sciences and clinical research and is currently uh, serving as the head of the investigation department at Hospital Angeles Puebla, Mexico. Dr. Barrientos Perez received her medical degree at La Salle University, Autonomous National University of Mexico, her postgraduate degree in pediatrics and pediatric endocrinology at the National Institutes of Pediatrics in Mexico City. Her experience in the field of pediatric endocrinology has been extensive since she began in 1986. Over the years, Dr. Barrientos Perez has served in several positions, including the head of pediatric endocrinology department and senior professor of pediatric specialty at the hospital Para El Niño Poblano in 1992 to 2016 and professor of endocrinology and pediatric endocrinology at three universities in Puebla City. Uh, Dr. Barrientos Perez has also garnered experience as a principal investigator in research studies since 1994. She's been the speaker and author of medical articles uh, and has focused uh, specifically on diabetes mellitus, obesity, and short stature. She is also the uh, former president of the Mexican Society of Pediatric Endocrinology and has received uh, pediatric academic merit acknowledgement by the University of Morelia, uh, Micho Michoacan, Mexico, Mexico. Thank you so much. Uh, it is our honor to have Dr. Perez as our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice presentation, Michelle. I'm going to speak about the Latin American experience in relation with COVID-19 pandemic and obesity in, ch in children. Okay. More than 360 million of people in Latin America are overweight or obese. Here are the five countries with the highest prevalence of obesity in Latin America. There are Uruguay with 23.5%, Chile with 29.1%, Argentina with 29.4%, 20, uh, Venezuela, with 30.8% and Mexico with 32.8%. Mexico is the leader in Latin America in childhood obesity. That's why I am going to show you some data of this country that is my country. In this slide, you can see the prevalence of overweight and obesity in different ages. For example, from zero to four years old, the prevalence of obesity in 2018 was 8.2. But here you can see also the risk of becoming overweight because the children in Mexico are living in an um, obesogenic environment. So in this uh, age from zero to four years, 22.4% have risk of being overweight if they live in urban communities. And if they live in rural communities, this risk is the 21.4%. In the group of the uh, five to 11 years old, the prevalence of overweight and obesity is 35.6%. This was in uh, 2018. 
and also the risk to becoming uh, overweight is very high. But the most important problem is in our teenagers because overweight and obesity prevalence is was in 2018, 35.8, but the global, this is for males, but the global was 30, 30, 30, um, 38.5%. So this is really a very high prevalence of obesity in 2018, but uh, the risk for, of being overweight is a uh, 24.7, if, we, if they live in the urban communities and if they live in rural communities is 21.0. This was before the pandemic. And then now we, I will show you data with the pandemic. This data is of the National Health and Nutrition Info or report uh, from 2020. This was when the COVID pandemic was already in Mexico for about one year. The, this uh, report was published in 2021. And here we can see the increase in obesity and overweight in relation to COVID pandemic in Mexico. In the group of five to 11, 11 years old, you can see here that the national prevalence of obesity and overweight increased from 20, 18, 36.5 to 2020 to uh, 38.2. So this is a very big increase. And uh, this was more, um, more in females, in males than in females. If we see the group of children from 12 to 19 years old, the teenagers, this is more important because in, in 2018 or 2019, the prevalence was 36.4. But after the pandemic, one year of pandemic, the increase of obesity and overweight was to 43.8 is more in females than in males. This is really a big change. This is really a big increase because it's more than seven points. So you see, this is really bad and we don't know what is happening just now because this data was from 2021 and we will, we will be waiting for data from 2022. And about the decrease in physical activity during pandemic, you can see the national uh, decrease and almost all groups of age have a decrease in 60 or more percent of physical activity during the pandemic. But there is a big, a big question. What causes decrease of COVID-19 pandemic in Latin America? Yes, but I am going to show you one of them. Change in dietary patterns with easy access to food at home, like snacks, but it's small or very large snacks, an intake of ultra processed and energy dense foods that are high in fat and sugars, an increase in sedentary with more time in front of the screen, like computer, TV, or cell phone, increase in physical inactivity outside home. This is associated with the fear of getting infected with COVID 19. Also, changing of educational programs, online classes. Lack during pandemic of supportive policies in sectors such as health, agriculture, transport, urban planning, environment, food processing, distribution, marketing, and education. The COVID pandemic and the confinement at home have caused sleep pattern disturbances. And finally, emotional change with anxiety, depression, and fear to the pandemic. Uh, what about the pathophysiology? Um, the experience from Europe has already, uh, doctor has already mentioned 
the pathology of obesity and COVID. Uh, we know that obesity is not a risk factor for becoming infected with COVID, but patients who have obesity are more likely to require intensive care. So it's a common comorbidity among COVID-19 patients with this severe form. And these four specific risk factors link obesity with severe COVID-19 form. Inflammation, blood clotting, ACE receptors, and obesity-related diseases. In Latin America, many children that come, come to our office in private practice to government practice, they also have another comorbidities when they, they go for the problem of obesity. They have metabolic syndrome, they have insulin resistance, they have glucose intolerance, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. So all of these diseases can increase the severity of symptoms of COVID. And the, if the obese patient have also hypoventilation syndrome, this will, be, will make harder to take full and deep breaks, breaths, compromising the pulmonary function. What about the challenges? We have a lot of challenges with this pandemic, but I am going to mention some ones in Latin America. The response strategies to the COVID-19 pandemic, such as school closures, lockdowns, and trade restrictions, are exacerbating challenges to child nutrition and global well-being with potential unprecedented negative impacts. Millions of children in Latin America lost access to essential school meals since school closures. Parents don't have the enough money to buy, uh, to buy food. And not only the quantity of food is important, but also the nutritional quality of this food. And maybe uh, the parents buy uh, not a healthy food because in Mexico, the junk food is cheaper than healthy food. Overweight and obesity will also increase quickly if current conditions persist. Because of COVID-19, okay, COVID Latin American communities face financial, and physical barriers to accessing nutritious food and healthy diets. And here are some recommendations. The Latin American countries have already designing and implementing important health programs for obesity prevention and also for obesity treatment. For example, front of package levels, regulation and program for the school environment and to provide healthy meals, food marketing regulations, sugar sweetness beverage taxes. They have promote different levels of physical activity at school, at home, at outside home. They, it's important avoid all behaviors that raise the risk of excessive weight gain in children. There is a need to run in progress and initiatives evaluating the impact after implementation. This is very important because in Mexico, in Latin America, we have programs, but I don't see with where these programs are running and I don't know who is evaluating the impact of these programs. And these programs are always start but I don't see when these programs is, are finishing. That's really a, a problem in Latin America and in Mexico. What can we uh, wait with this? Uh, what can we uh, see with this pandemic? <clears throat> there is a positive thing. This is that public health crisis could be a turning point that motivates people to develop healthy habits. Many people have started working daily, planning meals, and they have time for cooking at home, healthy, healthy food. The current health crisis may result in more people recognizing obesity as a disease, not a lifestyle choice. 
obesity is now, now being taken seriously and are the options to treat the disease. This is important. Thank you. I want to finish with this final recommendation. Children and their parents are coming to our private practice, to our government practice. They are asking for help against obesity. What are we doing? This is for all the physicians and pediatricians in Latin America. We need to do something. If we don't act today, our children will turn up at tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez. I think that your comments are very important uh, to the pediatricians who are participating in this webinar to realize that uh, obesity should be recognized as a disease, as a precursor to non-communicable diseases, and as a risk factor for severe complications due to COVID-19. I also like the fact that Dr. Perez told us that you know this is a turning point uh, for us now, and that we have an opportunity to sensitize families to the importance of healthy foods. And it starts with the pediatrician. So thank you so much, Dr. Perez. So um, Dr. Pulgan, I think we have just a few minutes for questions. Um, and I uh, you know, want to give you that opportunity to, to start us off. But I do want to say to everyone who is on this call, the participants, we got so many great questions. And we will only answer one or two at this time, but uh, we are going to be asking our speakers to um, answer uh, the questions more broadly at a later time. And we'll make sure you get that, your responses. Okay, so, thank you. Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Summer. Okay, uh, Aneta or Angie, can you share the uh, question? Uh, to Dr. Mesenji, George, how should we conserve adolescents who are diversity? Over to you, Josh. Josh? Yes, thank you for unmuting. So in terms of uh, counseling childhood obesity, so this is a question that is guided by many limitations. I'll just try to summarize what I think are the key, are the key areas that I think we would want to focus on. Now, number one is geographical limitation. I think childhood obesity when it comes to Africa and other regions might be quite different. And this comes to how the approach is for parents, to children on our side of, of the story. Now, children have a tendency of uh, being very, very uh, adherent to whatever their parents tell them in, in our setting. And so the counseling would start all from the parent's side towards the children's side. It's easier to counsel a child from the parent in our perspective rather than from from a foreigner, whether you be a clinician or whether you be a teacher. Now, this counseling comes in hand with actually approaches that are practical towards the children. And a lot of the approaches that we speak of, someone like sugar, sweet and beverage, you know, it makes sense to them. And uh, sometimes we raise the standard in terms of the taxation and the prices go up. Still, the children would opt for the same food. So the counseling comes with what is practical and practicality comes with uh, understanding the problem. So I would opt for behavioral change that is focused on cognitive understanding of what the problem is. And so a lot of the children that we had uh, intervened, once they took an understanding of what the problem was and an understanding that probably I have a problem because one of the key examples that I usually give is a student that was in university uh, that was quite obese and she was very proud. She came from a, a family that was very proud of her. And she was actually a role model towards others who are obese. So when we try to intervene in telling her that probably you have a problem, that that was a problem to her. So sometimes the approach of uh, bringing an understanding that this is a problem and probably you need to make some steps to, to adjust to it, I think that is one of the most important area. Cognitive understanding of a problem and the right approaches which are practical towards the setting is very important. 
Okay, next, uh, just a short answer, uh, George, because uh, this is during the pandemic. I know all the region and the culture, they have a different dietary. But in your opinion, because you have been traveling a lot also, what are the strategies you recommend for dietary management of obesity during the COVID-19 pandemic? <laughs> Yes. Now, this is a very beautiful question, but I think it can have quite different responses. Now, we, we have had quite limitations in terms of how the pandemic has affected our health system, especially knowing that a lot of African countries, such as Tanzania, have had never had lockdown. And so uh, I would say that the, the approach would be very different. We would use similar approaches that we were using before, because uh, the pandemic has affected how the systems work but not in terms of how the accessibility towards uh, or the availability towards the products or especially food products has been. So I'll still focus on uh, the school health programs and policy reformations uh, that actually affect the children uh, to a large majority of the time that they spend in their schools because we did not have the lockdown. So this, uh, this uh, is my approach towards this. Okay, thank you, George. Over to you, Michelle. Oh, great. Uh, we have some questions for uh, the other speakers. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pulungam. Uh, for Dr. Mazur, um, we wanted to uh, know about uh, the uh, different types of management. Uh, there were some questions around surgical and pharmaceutical interventions. And I wondered if you, you know, because we're uh, thinking about, you know, children and adolescents, you know, are these uh, management strategies advised for children? And if so, if you could elaborate on some of the um, promising um, interventions uh, for obesity that relate to pharmaceutical or surgical uh, approaches. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so in the in the treatment and prevention of obesity, we focus it mainly in children to maximizing opportunity for, for behavior changes during, uh, also during social distancing. So uh, we need to, for example, during uh, COVID pandemic um, uh, um, restriction, uh, for example, focus for eating planet meals times adventures for meal prepared at home, identified healthy snacks, uh, uh, focus for physical uh, activity built into daily routine walks, going outside, maybe dance. Uh, and uh, we need to um, uh, focus for education, include topics such as healthy food choices, nutrition, learning cooking, uh, very important, but not uh, on um, it's the sleep structure at the wake time and bedtime and screen time before bed. And uh, we need to create a routine uh, in, in each of those uh, um, uh, things. And uh, of course, continue uh, this uh, changes af uh, after the, the, the pandemic. And the uh, lifestyle changes, they um, play a main role uh, in the prevention and the treatment of childhood obesity. The benefit of for pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical intervention uh, is depend of the uh, and continent because, uh, <clears throat> uh, for example, in Europe, we have at the moment first from many years uh, uh, for many years, uh, drugs, uh, which uh, was approved for children um, um, above 12, 12 year, uh, years old. So, but uh, the benefits for use uh, uh, medicines uh, is uh, five to 10 percent more, uh, more, uh, more, um, uh, more changes in the BMI. Uh, than in the normal, uh, normal, normal uh, behavior changes. Uh, so we need to also uh, uh, looking for the cost of uh, the, those pharmaceuticals and uh, of course also the some kind of side effects. So this is the uh, the the main the main point that we routinely. 
not used uh, in everyday practice, the um, medicine in, uh, in an intervention. Of course, there are also some kind of cases like the uh, cases of monogenic form of obesity with, uh, with um, hyperphagia and, and others, which some of them we can have opportunity to treat by, by medicine. And of course, in those cases, we need to use the ph pharmacy. According to the surgical treatments, there's the special needs uh, for the massive obesity and uh, there are special inclusion criteria for those children and uh, the criteria which was uh, were performed by uh, AFP in America and also European uh, uh, everything is depend on the main point that uh, is that this is uh, not for all not for the um, one of the point <laughs> Uh, of the some kind of uh, uh, some kind of steps uh, during the treatment, the surgical treatment should be offered only for those very very uh, massive uh, uh, children with a very very massive obesity, which cannot have uh, had good results after the classical management after the classical management plus pharmacology and have a lot of uh, 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 comorbidities uh, uh, with, with, with obesity. So it's only it's also depend what kind of um, type of surgical intervention uh, we, we can offer for those children. So this is the time for, for, for <laughs> separate uh, separate lecture and we have uh, at the moment not enough time for, for that. Great, thank you so much for that uh, response. Um, and I think there may be one more question, but I my sense is uh, we need to focus on, as you mentioned, behavioral interventions and low risk interventions for the vast majority of children who are obese and this question was about pediatricians educating the family. I think you covered that actually pretty nicely to say that pediatricians need to provide that behavioral intervention. Of course, uh, the pediatrician have uh, played the key role in this in this case, and uh, especially pediatrician and GPs pediatrician, because they they have knowledge about the family history, family structure, family, uh, family finance status, and uh, they, they uh, know the BMI of uh, parents and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, other children. So they can organize uh, according this knowledge uh, Mm, the first step of the intervention, according uh, if they have knowledge about the eating uh, problems or eating uh, disturbances in those family, or they if they have knowledge about the level of physical activity, and uh, of course uh, everything is depend of the education level of parents and connection. So uh, the, this is the main. Uh, the main places for first intervention uh, and uh, education the the, fam the families the families uh, we can also um, estimate the goals for first steps the short term goals and uh, long term goals for in the treatment of obesity and of course uh, the short term goals should be easy to do because uh, increase the motivation to, for changes, etc. So, uh, for example, we need to not uh, discuss about the weight. We need to discuss you should be healthy. We need to not discuss uh, that you need to uh, uh, lose weight. Only, for example, you should, for example, if, if this is the girl, you should be uh, looks better, and you are going to the distress which we cannot uh, at the moment can uh, 
take. So uh, this is the very, very important for motivate children for, uh, and uh, for, of course, families. The changes should be performed for whole family, not only focused for children. And uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of things in this in this uh, in this uh, uh, cooperation. So maybe uh, next time we are going to have more. Time okay. To discuss about. <laughs> yeah. Thank yes. you, Doctor Matur. Yeah. yeah I you. think uh, there is a question for Doctor Barintos uh, Perez. Okay. Uh, please describe the role of processed foods for childhood obesity. <laughs> please, Doctor Perez. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, in Latin America, we have a big problem and more important in Mexico because we are near the United States uh, in the frontier with the United States. So we have easy access to ultra processed foods and they are really very bad for our children. Uh, sometimes the mothers start giving ultra processed foods Food to to children when in a very early age years, for example, sometimes they can um, buy the milk for the baby and they keep a sweetened a sugar sweetened a beverage instead of milk. This is a reality in Mexico. So uh, we have many ultra processed food in Mexico and also in Latin America. And our children, uh, our children like to, to eat this junk food. This is not really good, but uh, we have the opportunity uh, to change this with education. As other, uh, other doctors said, um, the education is the principal a problem in Latin America. We need more education about healthy food, healthy habits, about physical activity. There is really a problem, a problem because there are a lot of programs, like I was telling before, there are a lot of guidelines for prevent, for treat obesity, but in Latin America, these programs are not running. This is not a good result you can see this in the statistics of Mexico that I have just chose show you. Thank you. I think we are run out of time. Over to you, Dr. Farmer. For the All right, panel. great. Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, I think we have to um, move to our next phase, but I do want to thank all of the presenters uh, for their uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Um, now, I think we will move, uh, I think, to you, Dr. Pulangan. You're going to do a presentation of the um, survey. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we get the slide, please? Okay. Yeah, from the IPA uh, set, we did a uh, survey for the uh, 33 respondents from 28 countries from the seven region, from Europe, Asia Pacific, Sub Saharan Africa, Latin America, North America. Middle East and North Africa and Central Asia. Next, please. Next, please. So uh, we ask that in their perspective country, is there any national prevalence of data obesity in children? And about 75.8%, they have data for this. Yeah? And the rest, they don't know, or either they don't know, or uh, they, they don't have data. Next, please. And if yes, this is quite interesting. This is the result from Asia Pacific. You can see about uh, Thailand under five and Malaysia, India, Australia, China, Indonesia, Singapore, Pakistan, not available the data, Central Asia, Turkey have data. Next, please. Next, please. And so Sahara Africa, uh, Senegal, they have data. Uh, Botswana, they don't have the data yet. Europe region, most of the Europe country uh they have data yeah uh but not bosnia Herzegovina, uh, and also luxembourg they don't have the data yet next please and europe region like uh, in uk uh they have a specific data yeah they have data for uh, england 
Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And you can uh, read it here. And also different kind of age. Next, please. Middle East and North Africa. Uh, Palestine, they have data. Jordan also have data. Latin America, like uh, just from, from Dr. Perez. And Honduras also. North America, of course. USA and Canada, they have data. Next. And does the number of children with obesity increase during the COVID-19 pandemic in your country? 60.6% said yes. But probably the rest doesn't mean that, you know, not increasing, but most of them, they don't know. This is the problem. This is the dangerous one. But 60% said yes. Next. Is there any uh, level amount of sugar of salt sugar product in the country? Because there is a question that uh, how can we uh, motivate uh, everybody, you know, to put the level? Yeah, and most of them, uh, seventy-eight point eight percent, yes, but the rest they don't have the label yet. Next, uh, is there a maximum amount regulation? Uh, Sixty point eight percent, yes. Next. And are there exercising rules of country, uh, food packaging? Uh, yes and no for 42.4%. Uh, uh, and next, please. Uh, are there any program intervention from government for prevent obesity? 66.7%, yes, they have a program. And almost 30%, they don't have any program. Next, please. Are there any program intervention from school? 54.5. There is a program. But the rest, they don't know or they, they, they are not a program yet. Next. So private organization, non-private organization supporting child obesity in their country, 71%, yes. There is NGO that support to prevent obesity in children. Next. And if yes, they are program national or locally, and most of them is nationally. Uh, the rest is locally or maybe both and, and not available. Next. Are you aware of regional program established to prevent childhood obesity? Yes, in 58.1%. Next. Are you aware of WHO guidance concerning childhood obesity? Yes, in 77.4%. Next. Next. Are you aware of UNICEF guidance concerning childhood obesity? 51.6%. Yes. Next. Okay, this is the suggestion. I think this is okay. Next one. Next. Next. Okay, thank you. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Farmer. Probably uh, with the panelists, they can discuss about uh, our results. Over to you, Dr. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. And um, we have a very nice uh, introduction for all of them, uh, but I'm going to abbreviate due to time. So maybe if we go to the first, um, uh, the first uh, slide there. Yes, I'm introducing uh, Dr. Darren Delile, um, Dr. Fatma Feza Darren Delile is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Istanbul, uh, Istanbul Faculty of Medicine since 1996. She is the chief of pediatric endocrinology unit in Istanbul Faculty of Medicine. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, she chairs many um, uh, uh, scientific groups, including the Noonan Syndrome Group, uh, and uh, she's also been involved with meetings uh, around issues uh, involving other uh, syndromes, Turner syndrome, diabetes, growth hormone deficiency, among so many others. On the next slide, uh, Dr. Derendelile um, is also um, been uh, the um, uh, editor of the Journal of Clinical Research in Pediatric Endocrinology which is the official journal of the society since 2008. And on the next slide, she is also the associate editor of the Journal of Pediatric Endocrinology and Metabolism uh, and uh, has been um, 
the founder of the adolescent unit in her faculty, which is always great to hear. Um, next slide. Uh, the other uh, important noteworthy uh, thing is that Dr. Darren Delile also has translated many important uh, leaflets in her uh, in Turkish, her native language. So we thank you for that. And then we'll go to the next uh, presenter, uh, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Depis, uh, Depisalema Joel. And uh, Dr. Joel is the current president of the Union of National African Pediatric Societies and Associations, the chairman of the Botswana Pediatric Association and the current academic head of the Department of Pediatrics and Adolescent Health at the University of Botswana in Gaborone, Botswana. Okay, and then the next slide, uh, Dr. Joel has served as the president of the African Society for Pediatric and Ad Adolescent Endocrinology from 2018 to 2020. And he has also served as the chairman of Diabetes Association of Botswana for 10 years. Um, so he has also published uh, in multiple journals over 80 pieces of research and book chapters. So we welcome Dr. Joel. And then finally, Dr. Basim. Uh, Dr. Basim Alzubi is um, part of the Jordan Pediatric Board and Pediatric Endocrinology Certificate for Jordan Medical Council. Dr. Alzubi is the president of Jordan Pediatric Society. Uh, and he um, has a pediatric endocrinology fellowship in Jordan uh, and also has uh, uh, completed clinical pediatric endocrinology fellowship at UCLA in the United States. He is the senior consultant in pediatric endocrinology at Prince Hamza Hospital and Al Bashir Hospital in Amman, Jordan. He is also lecturer of the Faculty of Medicine at the Hashemit University in Jordan and head of pediatric directorate at George Jordan's Ministry of Health and the head of the pediatric department at Al Bashir Hospital, Amman, Jordan. Three very accomplished panelists. And I will thank you now for your, um, uh, your participation. And we're going to proceed to our, uh, each of the panelists to make some brief statements in view of time. I hope that you will try to be brief so that we can have a little bit of time for discussion. So we'll start with uh, uh, Feza. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for the uh, kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Yes, I will be very brief. Uh, so I will just be short to give some numbers uh, from Turkey and Asian countries, and then focus on uh, what we have been doing in Turkey. But Turkey, you know, is just between East and uh, West. And a uh, recent meta-analysis has shown that there's a 11.64-fold increase in obesity, prevalence of obesity, between 1990 and 2005 in uh, 5 to 6 is uh, 19-year-old children. More recent data, WHO, European uh, COSI study, the Childhood Obesity Surveillance uh, Initiative, showed that in uh, 2013, overweight was 14.2%, obesity was 8.3%, in 2016, overweight uh, is the same, which is which is fine, and obesity just increased a little bit to 9.6%. Uh, and another uh, national Turkish uh, population health research study also showed that actually there was a decrease uh, below five years of age in overweight children from 11% to 8%. But of course, during this pandemic, there are uh, several papers that have shown, uh, small scale studies that have shown uh, that uh, the BMI is increasing. And uh, in Asian countries, so Dr. Puta and previous speakers have given the numbers, so I will not go into them. Uh, but there are several factors actually which were valid before the pandemic uh, and but got worse actually uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, 
decrease in physical activity, decrease in consumption of fruits and vegetables, uh, change in food supply, dietary patterns, sleep duration, screen time, and so on. So these were actually uh, the factors before the COVID as well, but now uh, they worsen. So what uh, are we doing in Turkey? Uh, and we have to be more actually proactive in what we are doing so that the behavior, the, the change in the behavior during the pandemic does not continue. So uh, we uh, include obesity to our postgraduate training programs organized by the Turkish National Pediatric Society and others. So we have to increase these actually. Uh, this is for primary care physicians and pediatricians to increase the awareness, prevention, and also the comorbidities. Uh, we have a project going on with the Minister of Health and Minister of uh, Education. Uh, it's called uh, Diabetes at School Program. So we incorporated uh, obesity to that program uh, before the pandemic, actually. And we educate teachers, school nurses, families, and children. We did that face-to-face -face in different parts of Turkey uh, and uh, online afterwards. Now we have to be, again, more active with these uh, things. Another uh, thing that is just been starting, actually, in two days, World Diabetes Days, is the project called Cities Changing Obesity. It's a project with a sponsor and the uh, leader is the Istanbul municipality, uh, getting all the stakeholders together, parents, uh, healthcare workers, policymakers, uh, public and private sectors. And the main focus is the prevention of obesity and change of behavior. I think it would be very good that this project starts after this uh, COVID infection at least uh, resolving. What we had planned to do, I'm just finishing, Michelle, is actually uh, another school project. The children are measured uh, quite well until five years of age. But afterwards, they're not measured so uh, routinely. So, uh, but the children in Turkey, in schools, they're measured actually, weight and height annually. So we thought that we could start this project with Minister of Health and Education again to put this data together in a web registry, and especially after this pandemic, to pick up the overweight and the obese ones, and then refer the ones to the physicians, the ones at risk, uh, more uh, sooner, uh, uh, so that we have the result. So, uh, as I said, we have to be proactive uh, after this uh, pandemic, and, but as Dr. Perez has uh, said very well, emphasized that we have to do the monitoring as well. So we have to have realistic, measurable outcome results to see what's going on. And we'll have to control what's going on actually. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very important issues around data and monitoring these issues longitudinally for positive change. Uh, Dr. Joel. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michelle. And uh, let me take the opportunity to greet all pediatricians around the world. We had the opportunity to join our webinar. Uh, I just want to make some comments in terms of uh, the data that has been presented so far, including the survey that was presented by Aman. Uh, really, as you can see from the statistics, we are all speaking the same language that uh, really uh, childhood obesity has been in the rise in the last couple of years. Uh, the world has become more urbanized. Uh, people are leading sedentary lifestyles. There's access to refined food with a lot of calories and uh, unhealthy food. And as a result of that, we have really seen an increment, a big increment in terms of the statistics, in terms of childhood obesity and the consequence of the health related issues that comes with the childhood obesity. So at this point in time, really, having arrived where we are, is uh, how as pediatrician, do we tackle the increase in child obesity? Because if no intervention is, is not made now, in the coming years, we are really heading for a big epidemic. The COVID-19 was just a catalyst 
in the problem that has been existing over the years, that has been building over the couple of years. So, which means it starts with us with pediatricians. I mean, if I take the anecdotal data from the clinical attendants uh, here locally in our region, uh, we have had more referrals coming in uh, to our tertiary center referred with obesity than any other time of the year that we have had. So, which means the problem is there. Even if we are to do the survey at this point in time to confirm it, but the problem is already there. So which means we need to make an intervention that will benefit everybody and nip the problem in the bud. Uh, my observation is that the childhood obesity is usually also shows a, a problem that is inherent within the family because you've got a situation where all members of the family are all obese. Uh, mother and father are obese, the siblings are obese. So which means there's an inherent problem in the family in terms of the eating pattern. So which means as pediatricians, which we are here today, when you get a referral, not only treat the child alone, but try to change the entire family in terms of how, how they eat. Because otherwise, if you just try to focus on one person at a time, that is not sustainable in the long run. But this has to make the program, the program sustainable is to change the entire family and make them to change to a lower calorie diet and increased physical activity. Again, in terms of the calories, it's also difficult because if people are used to a certain kind of lifestyle, it's very hard for them to change to that lifestyle. So you try to kind of build into the already existing routines. What is the routines? First of all, just as a pediatrician, try to go into the history to find out what's the lifestyle of the, of the family life, what is their routine. And then when you come up with the plan, we have to build a plan that is integrated into their routines. If there's too much calories in the family, as you may have identified through your interaction with the patient, one of the simplest recommendations could be, why don't you go for half in terms of what you have been eating in the family? It's very easy to measure half. Instead of what you have been eating, make everything half, half, half throughout the time and see what will come out of that. Then from there, in terms of the physical activity, try to integrate it into the activity to say, what is the first thing that you do early in the morning? Then try to find out all these routines and integrate that physical activity into the daily routines because that way makes it sustainable. Otherwise, if you make it something that is a side job or tangential to the daily routines, it's not gonna become sustainable. They're gonna lose motivation during the course of time and then they're gonna quit from the program. So with that, uh, Michelle, I uh, can see it's running out of time. So I will just hold it there and uh, give the opportunity to my other colleagues and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Joel. This was really wise words and great solutions. Uh, now we are going to give the floor to Dr. Uh, Basim Alzubi for his perspectives. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, thank you, Michelle, and uh, good evening, everybody. First, I want uh, to uh, to give a comment about the data given by uh, Dr. Aman regarding the uh, prevalence of obesity in our region. Uh, there is only two countries responded to the uh, this survey, and there, uh, these were Jordan and the Palestine. However, uh, our region. Uh, according to the uh, WHO, is one of the highest uh, region in the world in regard to the prevalence of obesity in children. And uh, also, uh, uh, according to the WHO, uh, from this region, there are several countries who are also from the top countries in the prevalence of uh, obesity. These countries are Kuwait, uh, which the prevalence of obesity in children uh, reaches about uh, up to 50 to 60 percent of the students uh, uh, in, uh, in the schools. Also, uh, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, Qatar, uh, Bahrain, uh, Egypt. Uh, and uh, if you see these uh, six, five of these countries, these six countries uh, are from the Gulf area uh, where they have uh, uh, two uh, high income uh, and uh, uh, GDP per capita 
uh, are is the highest maybe in the world, for instance, in Qatar and uh, Emirates. Uh, but what uh, what uh, makes our region is the highest uh, maybe, or these countries is the highest uh, are the highest in the world in regard to the prevalence of obesity in children. Uh, maybe there are several problems or factors contributing to this uh, problem. Uh, and, and one of these is this high income in these countries, which uh, uh, which make uh, also uh, which makes these uh, children uh, have are free to buy uh, any kind of food, especially fast food, uh, uh, junk food, uh, chips, uh, 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 and uh, unhealthy food. Uh, another uh, thing is the weather. Uh, they have, I mean, the hot weather, which also prevent the children from having uh, uh, a lot of time uh, uh, with physical activity uh, activities out the door, and instead stay in their homes, watching television and playing with electronic games and using uh, social media uh, devices. Uh, also, uh, this also increased the sedentary uh, lifestyle in these countries, all of these uh, uh, things are factors, risk factors for uh, the obesity in general in the world. Uh, and the, oh, oh, in regards to uh, other problems facing the region, not just these uh, uh, rich countries, uh, there are uh, uh, many conflicts in the region, uh, uh, especially in Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, Yemen, Libya, uh, and these uh, conflicts uh, are similar to the, uh, in, in their effects to the COVID, because uh, that means the, the streets are insecure, so uh, children uh, cannot go to, to, uh, to play or to uh, practice exercise and physical activities outdoors. Uh, and also uh, this increases the prevalence of psychological and, and uh, psychiatric problems in these children. And this is a factor also in, in contributing the prevalence of, uh, uh, of, uh, of obesity in these uh, children. Uh, uh, of course, uh, when uh, there are millions of refugees uh, children in camps, uh, many good proportions of them uh, cannot attend the schools and they stay in homes. Also, they don't have infrastructure for physical activities outside their uh, uh, tents or, or camps, and uh, these uh, factors contribute to the increase in obesity in our uh, region. Uh, you, 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 uh, my colleagues talk about uh, uh, COVID and its effect. Uh, other fac another factor in our region is the infrastructure uh, in regarding, uh, regard to the uh, lack of, uh, of gardens and uh, parks uh, uh, no special uh, lines for bicycling, uh, and by the way, it is uh, rarely uh, to see a child who is going to school by bicycle or uh, uh, to see a person uh, going to, the, to his work by bicycle. Uh, but uh, 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 public transportation uh, forces the people to go by their own cars or, or uh, even taking uh, tech taxes to their, uh, and that means uh, less uh, physical activities for children and for, for persons. Uh, the legislation, the lack of legislation available to, uh, to for instance, for promotion of food marketing for uh, uh, breast milk uh, 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 substitutes uh, for, for uh, marketing of uh, formulas, uh, also, legislations for school, we don't have regulations, we don't have uh, uh, legislations to restrict uh, uh, buying uh, uh, fast food or high uh, sugar and sweetened uh, drinks and beverages uh, uh, and, and the snacks in uh, school stores and even in near school stores. Uh, I think these, uh, all these issues uh, contribute to the increasing uh, prevalence of obesity in children and adolescents in, and adults in our and our area, and of course uh, this needs uh, uh, a big uh, action plan uh, in order to to fight this uh, big problem 
And uh, my colleagues previously talked about uh, some solutions of, of this uh, bigger problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Basim. Um, all of our panelists, I want to thank all of you. You have really given us a lot of uh, ideas for how we can make some positive solutions, positive change. Um, I think as uh, we have said, we need more time to have this discussion. And so we are going to go May, ahead. This should be part two of the uh, thing, Michelle. I think we should. <laughs> I think we should also, Dr. Pulangan, that this is, uh, this is an important moment, World Obesity Day, but it's opening the door for much more conversation. Yeah. This and we collect and I, all I the questions and then we will try to reach everybody. And then probably the next one we will make the, the, the second uh, webinar about yes. obesity. We should, yes, we will definitely. All right, so the floor is yours, Dr. Pulangan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think uh, we almost uh, yeah, to the end of the session. I think I will uh, get back the uh, time uh, to. Uh, Arneta, I think. Once again, on behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to extend our warmest round of gratitude and appreciation to all our speakers, moderators, and participants for making the international webinar on pediatricians tackle childhood obesity and the COVID-19 pandemic a great success. We hope that this webinar has equipped you to become agents of change, champions regarding the prevention of childhood obesity, especially in the era of the COVID-19 pandemic in your respective countries and communities. Communities. Furthermore, the International Pediatric Association conducts routine webinars with a wide range of topics concerning child health. To keep yourself up to date, we urge you to follow IPA on our social media platforms as detailed on this slide. We also have several opportunities for you to participate in IPA webinars and activities. First, IPA will be having the IPA Congress next year in 2023. For more details, log on to www.ipa2023congress.org. IPA also provides opportunities for healthcare workers to enroll in the IPA Vaccine Trust course to become a certified vaccine champion. The course is open to all healthcare workers for free. Refer to the post and the IPA website for more information. Once again, warmest round of gratitude to all parties who have made this webinar a great success. Thank you, and we hope to see you at the next webinar.